very good afternoon and welcome back to the symposium 3 and uh, the symposium that's coming up is safety is not accident and we have uh, three expert surgeons who will be talking to us about the preventive and safety measures uh, related to injury prevention and our first speaker is dr chamira bandara who is a consultant ocular plastic surgeon at national eye hospital colombo and he'll be talking to us about how to uncover your deductive power at eye injuries. Dr. Shamira Bandara, or to you. Yeah, okay. Right, okay. Hi, Buan. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank the president and the organizing committee of SLMA for inviting me to do this presentation at SLMA Foundation Session 2020. Uh, working in a casual room is always challenging. Uh, when it comes to eye injuries, condition is uh, more challenging if you haven't worked in eye unit earlier. So conditions like these are quite obvious. Anyone working in the uh, casual room can detect these things. You don't need MBBS to detect this. Of course, you need MBBS to treat them, but uh, these conditions are quite obvious. But the challenge comes when things are not obvious, when uh, things are not seen at the first uh, sight. So there you have to be a smart guy. So uh, the proper clinician should be an, a detective uh, who has a very uh, uh, high deductive capability to detect uh, uh, unseen problems. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, mentioned his uh, book in Sherlock Holmes it is uh, uh, my business to know what other people don't know. Similarly, the clinician should know what other people can't see and know. Uh, time is very crucial at casualties. The delay in diagnosis, uh, these problems can uh, life-threatening and vision-threatening. Why? The eye signs could be a clue for a life-threatening uh, uh, injury. In the same time for delay, can lead to life-threatening problems. In the meantime, delay in detecting and treating eye problem, there will be a less chance that you get good visual recovery and other function recovery. So whatever the, the, uh, the detection has to be done quite fast. So in my presentation, uh, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, four common uh, presentations and their causes and how to uh, work out uh, uh, through the patient. And I must say that I'm not going to concentrate on uh, the quite obvious gross injuries, but uh, think about and discuss about uh, uh, unseen or uh, the conditions which can easily overlook. Uh, altered vision. I think uh, this is one of the, the common presentation at uh, common presentation related to eye. Uh, there uh, we need to find because we don't have full equip, equip uh, eye assessment at casual room. So uh, we need to find out whether this altered vision is correct. So we need to go through the patient's past ocular problem and find out whether pay, uh, the patient had previous, uh, the poor vision, previous eye problem. And the other thing is the, uh, the patient's usual glass may be broken at the time of injury. So. Detection of poor vision at eye casual may be challenging. So we have to rely more on the history. We have to ask whether there is a real deterioration of vision which has been from the normal vision which has been uh, there before the injury. And I must say, I'm not going to uh, uh, discuss about obvious gross injuries. Right, coming to uh, uh, altered vision, the one scenario we must think is, uh, undetected uh, vision problem, which really detected after injury. For example, if one, one has poor vision in one eye with good vision in another eye, when the both eyes are open, they, uh, they might not detect that poor vision in that eye. So uh, that during, after injury, uh, uh, because of the pain or irritation, they try to close one eye. And uh, at that time, he, all of a sudden, he might realize uh, the, the vision is poor in one side. So uh, we need to uh, get a good history and find out how he detected that. And we need to look for common other causes like uh, refractive cases can get uh, the good vision after a pinhole or with a refraction. And all the other cases, uh, 
other cases we have to do a thorough uh, the examination to find out other than uh, causes other than injury in these patients and then uh, if you have a good uh, uh, if you can check the vision visual acuity there can be two scenarios one one with good visual acuity complain of uh, impaired vision another one with reduced visual obvious impaired uh, visual acuity so when you have uh, uh, impaired vis uh, good visual acuity 66 or 69 but still the patient complain of poor vision okay you can't say your vision is okay uh, 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 by because there are conditions where you can have good vision but with eye injuries. So uh, coming to cornea, so you can have blunt injuries like this. Uh, so you can slightly change the cornea shape and guide, induce an astigmatism. So you might, patient might complain of poor vision because of that. And if you do a refraction, an auto refraction, and sometimes corneal topography, you can detect that. And tiny corneal uh, partial thickness lacerations, which are away from visual axis, might it, uh, might miss easily unless you do a slit lamp examination with proper slit beam, where you can get optical uh, cross section of the cornea. And tiny foreign bodies close to visual axis may not be detected unless you do good examination with higher magnification. Similarly, small corneal epithelial defect will be overlooked unless you stain with fluorescein. Uh, uh, you might miss that if you don't do that. And the pupil defects also can be associated with some amount of visual impairment because uh, uh, meiosis or midriasis can uh, alter the light entry to the eye and uh, thus the, the clarity of the image. The Both meiosis and midriasis can be due to the iris injury and can also be due to uh, the nerve injuries like Horner syndrome, the meiosis, and the third nerve palsy with the dilated or the midriasis. So the detection of these very important so that you need to look for the brain injury. And then bilateral uh, uh, meiosis can be due to pontine hemorrhage or uh, substance abuse like cocaine. Again, bilateral midriatic eye can be due to uh, abuse of heroin and opioids. Why I mentioned about this substance abuse because the substance may be the cause, may be the risk factor for the injury or the accident. And then uh, coming to the anterior chamber and the vitreous, slight bleeding with microscopic high femur and the anterior traumatic anterior uveitis where you get the white cell floating in the anterior chamber or uh, mild uh, vitreous hemorrhage, you have the red cell floating in the vitreous, might have a good vision, but uh, not clear as earlier. So you need a thorough examination to find these things. And the coming to the retina, you can get retinal edema, we call uh, uh, commercial retina because of the tra brand trauma. So uh, that can impair the vision. And if the, vis the fovea is intact, uh, uh, the visual acuity can be normal. And coming to optic nerve, the optic nerve injury, we usually call traumatic optic uh, neuropathy, uh, uh, can again can have a normal vision, 6-6. But, uh, unless you do a, a pupil check for the RAPD and the color vision test and the visual field, you might miss that. Okay. Particularly if the central vision is normal, the visual acuity can be normal, but the peripheral in injury will be detected with the visual field which need treatment. And so when you have good vision, manage, uh, the analysis is challenging. On the other hand, vision act visual acuity is low, you can't miss the cause, you must find the cause. And come to the cornea again, these are the not obvious cases, you can have decimate rupture as in the, the top picture, the decimate is the basement membrane of the inner layer, endothelium of the cornea, then you can have the rupture and it, there can be a fluid leak and you can get edema and the impairment of vision. And you can have the endothelium that is the inner layer can get uh, traumatized and dysfunction. You can get corneal decompensation, either focal or diffuse. So you can get the corneal edema gain and uh, can impair the vision. So these things you need a th uh, uh, thorough uh, sit lamp examination to detect that. Uh, I, I want to mention about the sclera, just as clear as well, because you can have anterior sclera rupture uh, uh, like this. But of course, if there's a subconjunctal hemorrhage, you will not see the, the rupture. Then, of course, if the patient is having soft eye, low intraocular pressure, and probably deviated pupil like this, 
then you need to think about possible scleral rupture even you don't see the pigment under the conjunctiva. Coming to lenses, if there's a gross cataract like this, it's quite obvious, but the trauma can lead to posterior feather cataract where you get a very small cataract formation in the posterior lens, which will be detected only with good dilatation and uh, acid lamp examination. And the lens can be dislocated into the anterior chamber. If it is clear, it will not detect with the torch, of course, slit lamp examination is mandatory. Again, lens can displace back into the vitreous and to the retina. Uh, so the iris plane will be empty, but will not be seen with the torch, but we need uh, the slit lamp examination to detect that. And the fundal examination will show the, the lens on the retina. And again, there can be, uh, depending on the history, you, if you suspect a foreign body, if there's a tiny entry which has self-sealed, uh, there can be foreign body in the lens, lenticular foreign body, and a need of uh, 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 kind of a good examination to detect that if you suspect from the history. Then the anterior chamber and the vitreous. If you look at the top pictures, uh, what is on your ha right hand side is the normal anterior chamber depth. But on the left side, you can see very abnormally deep anterior chamber. Uh, uh, this condition can be uh, associated with posterior scleral rupture. Having low intraocular pressure further add help for your clinical diagnosis. And then you can do a MRI can where you can see the, the probably you can see the site of injury with the deformed sclera. And the posterior segment foreign bodies. Again, uh, based on the history, if you are suspecting a foreign body, you need to do a very thorough uh, fundal examination after full dilatation. Uh, the history about the trajectory, the direction of the foreign body is useful where, uh, to, for you to decide the, uh, where you are going to look for. And the B scan, CT scan, X-rays might helpful in detecting in difficult situations. And vitreous hemorrhage, if it's a gross thing, it's quite obvious. There's no difficulty in diagnosis, but I want to mention about this pre-retinal hemorrhage, where you get the bleeding between the vitreous and the retina in front of the fovea. The blood is really toxic to the uh, retinal cells. So if you don't treat this immediately, there will be permanent uh, retinal cell damage in front of the fovea and there'll be difficulty in recovering the vision. So if you detect this, you must immediately refer to a eye surgeon to get rid of this blood. And then coming to the retina, uh, the choroid. So if you've seen the fundus, this is the choroidal rupture. This is a large one, but if you, a small one like this, you need a good skill to detect during your fundal examination. The foveal, foveal edema, the commercial retina or the retinal edema involved in the fovea can, uh, uh, as I explained earlier, but they are, they are involved in the fovea, you can get poor, very poor vision. The macular hall, post-traumatic, there can be a, 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 a separation of macular tissues at the fovea level, and so we call macular hall. And uh, if it is small, even with the good retinal uh, exam examination, you might miss that. So if you need to, if you suspect that, of course you have to ask for a OCT scan where you can clearly see the uh, the uh, inter uh, this, uh, break of integrity in the foveal level. And then the retinal tears and detachment. The, the retinal tears can happen after a trauma. So when you have tear, from there onwards, retina can slowly get detached it's from partial to complete. So it's important to detect this early. If a patient complain of flashes or floaters after trauma, and if there's a segmental visual field defect, so uh, uh, need to suspect this and then uh, did need thorough or the fundal examination uh, to detect this and treat earlier uh, to avoid full detachment, which can be uh, uh, ch very challenging. Coming to optic, nerve, optic neuropathy, which I discussed partly earlier, can have the normal to a uh, non-perception life vision. The pupil will uh, have APD, that is apparent pupil defect or relative apparent pupil defect, color vision defect, visual fields. If it's the same, the, the, the significant damage, there will be central visual field impairment. However, the fundal examination can be normal in most cases, but sometimes you can have retinal edema and the disc edema. CT also may not be useful in most of the cases where you not see any significant uh, the changes, but really you can have bone fragment 
closer to the orbital apex. So why do you get uh, the, the traumatic optic neuropathy without a fracture? Because uh, during the, the blunt trauma, there can be a relative movement of the optic nerve in relation to the optic canal. Then the tiny pile vessels can get a uh, break and the, that part of the optic nerve go into ischemia and uh, 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 vision can be uh, uh, deteriorated. So that's about the altered vision. So uh, moving to the next topic, that is the double vision. Seen two images of the same ob object in a field of vision. So why do you get a single vision but with the both eyes? How do you get? That is because when you get the one image, the uh, the uh, the image, uh, the one object image form in the, the current corresponding retinal points, which are wired to the same locus in the occipital brain, and then uh, it will be seen as a single. But when there's a misalignment, the object will not be, uh, image will not be formed in the same corresponding points and so the, in the brain and there will be a double vision. But there's a special scenario for same corresponding retinal points, you can get image of two different objects, which lead to overlapping of uh, images and so brain will get a bit of confused. So they will not be able to identify what the, the object is. So when you come into analysis of uh, the diplopia, the first thing is you need to find out whether it's a monocular diplopia or binocular diplopia. Binocular diplopia, so in the, when the both eyes are open, there will be double vision. But when one eye is closed, there will be no double vision. And that is usually due to a problem with the alignment of two eyes. And the monocular diplopia, even you close the one eye, the diplopia will persist. And this is usually due to the core origin and from the optical problem in the one, in the one eye. So come to the monocular vision, the things can get confused again is a blurred vision. So mild to moderate blurred vision, some people perceive as double vision. So it's important that you need to ask specifically if this is a blurred vision or it's a double vision. And if it's a blurred vision, it can get cleared with uh, uh, pinhole or correction with that. And coming to the cornea, the same kind of blunt trauma to the cornea can change and its shape and get multiple uh, uh, refractive powers at different uh, uh, segments in the cornea. So you can get multiple uh, image forms in the back of the retina leading to the, uh, um, uh, double vision. So if you do a pinhole test, uh, that will block some of the segment and might get the, uh, the diplopia get cleared. On the other hand, doing an auto refraction, corneal topography, which will confirm the, the abnormal shape shape of the cornea. As usual, this cornea shape uh, is a transient thing, but uh, rarely it can persist for a longer period. The iris. Iris, of course, with the injury, you might get a, a, a additional defects in the iris, or you can get the iris get uh, detached from its attachment to the ciliary body in one point or from the multiple places. So when you have this kind of multiple uh, 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 holes like we call secondary uh, pupils as you get each pupil act as one uh, one visual segment so you might get multiple image form on back of the retina leading to monocular uh, diplopia and then the lens subluct lens so if you get the lens sometimes after cataract you might get a segmental cataract like this in the top picture and the, so there will be two different segments in the lens with different optic powers refractive powers and you get two images form and double vision and the lens or the implanted lens can get subluxated so across the pupil. So there are two segments, one is with the lens and one is without lens. So you obviously you get uh, two image from the retina called into say, monocular double vision. And the retinal detachment again, when there's partial retinal detachment, the one segment, the image form in the one segment will be different from the other segment. So the one, this one will be blurred and it's more anterior and this will be more sharp, it's more posterior. So the brain will perceive it as a uh, double vision. And cerebral polyopia. This interesting thing, but uh, it's very rare. But trauma to the brain can cause uh, 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 polyopia, which is episodic and you might see two or more images and it doesn't Okay, at the time of fixation, take about milliseconds to seconds to you get the double vision and it lasts for seconds and hours. And then it drift or fade or disappear gradually. And the double vision is either one side or both side of the, uh, the focus of object. And it, the direction of double vision can be either vertical or uh, 
uh, horizontal or diagonal. And the images can be of different size and the double vision can occur both for the near and the distance things. And the motion of object either disappear this double vision or drift to another object where you get again polyopia. So this is basically diagnosed with the history. So you had to be, you had to know this for us to us ask from the patient. And uh, the binocular double vision is due to the misalignment with uh, to a visual axis, which can be due to either displacement of the globe or uh, impairment of the eye movements. So the globe displacement can be due to any space occupying lesion like hematoma displacing the globe or the bone fragment displacing the globe, air inside the orbit displacing the globe or foreign body inside the orbit displacing the globe. So these conditions can cause globe dystropia and uh, need uh, scans usually to uh, detect these things. And the next thing is possible is the prolapse of uh, globe into sinuses. For example, if you have a large orbital flow uh, uh, fracture with defects or medial wall fracture, globe can uh, 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 prolapse uh, either mild or severe to the globe, uh, uh, to the sinus and will get a uh, 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 binocular double vision. And the ocular motor defects uh, can be due to muscle injury then usually only one muscle involved, so you get the dysfunction of the one uh, muscle action. And the muscle damage can be at the ten tendon level, so where you get the tendon attachment, if you see a laceration, a scleral or conjunct laceration, you need to suspect and look for the tendon to find out this uh, uh, injury, if there's eye movement defect. And then uh, the muscle belly can get damaged by penetrating injury. So if there's a penetrating injury with the eye movement impairment, so you need to do MRI scan to find out the muscle disruption. And the mechanical problem. For example, if you have flow fracture with the muscle and the soft tissue prolapse, this muscle will not get relaxed when uh, the looking up uh, the opposite direction. For example, when looking up, this side doesn't rotate upwards when, because there is a flow fracture with uh, tissue entrapment. And if you do a forced action test where you catch the eyeball and uh, move manually and you will feel the resistance for opposite direction. And then uh, the foreign bodies in, in relation to the muscle can uh, uh, impair the, the movement even with a small injury like this. If the, the history is suggestive of possible uh, yeah, for, foreign body inside the orbit, we have to go for a scan when there's an eye movement defect. And the paralytic things are quite obvious. We know about third, fourth, and sixth nerve poles can lead to a uh, double vision. So if the typical picture is there in your examination, you can diet and you should not forget about the internucleophthalmopedia, uh, uh, where which can be detected clearly on the examination findings. I just want to mention a few things. One is superior orbital fissure syndrome, where the, all the optic, all three nerves leave the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. Any fracture at that point can damage all three nerves, so the eye, eye will be frozen, or there will be total external ophthalmophilia. When it comes to the skull base, the nerves can again slightly deviate, but you might have two or three nerve involvement with the skull base fractures associated with uh, uh, fifth nerve, my mandible, maxillary nerve. Uh, uh, sensory loss will uh, uh, you make you to suspect about the skull base fractures and then you have to ask for a scan. And if uh, uh, the oculometer defect is associated with long tract signs, of course, you have to think about the brainstem injury uh, where you have to go for a, a brain scan. Coming to the next topic, the proptosis, it's not uncommon, but can be mild to more severe uh, in uh, 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 severity. And one condition I want to mention is orbital compartment syndrome. When there's a sudden expansion of the tissue pressure in the orbit, so you might get mild proptosis with tight lid, uh, tight lids uh, where you can't uh, move the lid apart and there'll be a lot of uh, redness, chemosis and the high intraocular pressure. So you have to think about orbital compartment syndrome because the detection of this is very important because uh, if you delay the treatment, uh, there will be optic, permanent optic nerve damage. So you need to do a canthotomy and cantholysis to release the pressure. So detection is very important to timely management. Proptosis, again, there can be pseudoproptosis. 
For example, if with the brain damage, you might get lead retraction with the scleral show and you will think it is a proptosis, but it's of course a brain damage. So if you look from the top or if you with the exophthalmometer, you will find that both eyes are at the same level, but no proptosis. And of course, lead rim fracture with posterior dislocation of the orbital rim and it will expose the sclera more and you will get a false impression of uh, proptosis. And the opposite tie, enophthalmosis due to either orbital flow fracture or any other problem. So you might get the good, you might think it's a good diagnosis proptosis. So uh, you need to find that. And the true uh, uh, proptosis can be due to a space occupied lesion or, or due to a congestion, vascular congestion. So what are the uh, space occupying lesion which can happen? Uh, one is the bleeding, either supra subperiosteal bleeding or retroorbital bleeding or inferior orbital bleeding, which can uh, push the globe forward. And the air, and particularly when with fractures involved in the medial wall and the flow, uh, the air can frap uh, air can enter into the orbit from the sinuses, particularly after an episode of sneezing or nose blowing or straining all of a sudden air can leak into the orbit and suddenly you can get proptosis and sometimes with vision impairment. So it's very important to ask the patient not to blow the nose if there's a, 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 a if suggestive of fractures in the uh, orbital floor. And the CSF and the brain, CSF can leak in, into the orbit through a roof defect with uh, dural uh, tear. Uh, in addition to proptosis, you might feel the CSF under the skin uh, like fluidic and if you do the scan uh, you might uh, you can find the uh, uh, the dural uh, damage and the CSF leak into this and the brain can again prolapse into the orbit through the roof defect with the fracture and uh, with proptosis and one clue for this is uh, having pulsation over the eye when you feel uh, the flash you might get the brain pulsation without uh, 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 much thrill or brewing and the scans will help you to detect that. And then the bone, bone can displace into the, with fractures, bone can displace into the orbit, and then it can give additional volume to the orbit and push in the globe forward, or otherwise it, bone itself can push the globe forward, uh, causing proptosis. So CT will definitely diagnose that. And the foreign body, if the history is suggestive of possible foreign body with proptosis, yeah, you must do a imaging to find whether there's a retroorbital foreign body, and uh, which can associate with slight bleeding and tissue edema and inflammation, which will add to the proptosis. And even if there's no lead injuries, this entry of the foreign body can be elsewhere, even temple, other side, nose, cheek, forehead. Still, you have to think about possible retroorbital foreign bodies. Congestion are the most important thing for the proptosis of trauma. One is keratokinous fistula. With the head injury, you might get a, a fistula formation with the internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus. So the arterial blood go into the cavernous sinus and the superior and the inferior ophthalmic veins, which lead to slight proptosis with congestion. And you will see radially di uh, directing uh, scleral uh, uh, dilated blood vessels, we call proctru vessels. And the patient might also complain a little bit of uh, like a hearing uh, uh, a sound inside the brain or behind the eye and <clears throat> might get a, a, a pulsation of vision. And if you feel you might get the, the pulsation and uh, thrill and if you hear, you might hear brewing with that. So detection is very important. This, you can confirm with the MRI, uh, can detect whether there's any features of that and confirm with the DSA. And it's important to detect this because you don't need to refer this patient to an eye surgeon, but refer to the neurosurgeon because they, there are instances we get patients with uh, keratokinous vestibule referring to the eye surgeon, but it should go to the neurosurgeon. And orbital cellulitis, uh, injuries with uh, contaminated objects uh, can introduce virulent infection. Even within one to two days, you might develop uh, uh, orbital cellulitis uh, in this patient. So uh, if you get a worsening proptosis, redness and pain, deviated eye or reduced eye movement, and uh, you, if you suspect a penetrating injury, then better do a scan and the, the features will help you to identify the orbital cellulitis. And the cavernous sinus thrombosis 
can happen with the base of the skull fractures as well as with uh, uh, infection in the lid and the orbit. And uh, uh, with that, you might get a little bit of mild proptosis and congestion of the uh, in the conjunctive as well as the retinal vein congestion. Patient might complain of headache and bit of vomiting, nausea. And uh, based on the clinical features, you might get a little bit of dyskidemia. And if you, based on the clinical features, if you suspect that you have to do this, and it's very important, this is maybe life-threatening if you to, for you to detect this, and then you can refer to the uh, neurologist for the further management. Uh, coming to the last topic, post-traumatic ptosis, it is common. And uh, first, again, there will be pseudo uh, uh, ptosis where uh, things can mimic ptosis. One is the opposite tie lid retraction, which can happen with the brain injury. So you will see the normal eye is totality. And on the other hand, uh, the, the affected eye may be having enophthalmosis. So the eye is going back. So the lid is coming down. You think it's ptosis, but it's really enophthalmosis. And here, if you see, the eye is rotated slightly upward. So we call hypertropia. When you hypertropia, more of the, the cornea is get covered by the lid and you think it is ptosis, but it's basically hypertropia, which can assist with nerve injuries. These two pictures are interesting. See, so there will be ptosis, but when you cover one eye, the lid gets nicely open up. So why do you get this? So you can get the ptosis as a, a kind of, a, a, as a compensation for double vision. So when you have double vision, uh, involuntary, people try to keep one eye closed. And when you cover the uh, one eye, so the lid gets nice, opposite eye, the lid gets nicely open up because there's no double vision. So remember that the diplopia can lead to pseudoptosis. And the uh, uh, true ptosis can be due to mechanical, aponeurotic, myogenic, or neurogenic. So mechanical ptosis can be due to a blood which fill in the lid or tissue fluid filling, uh, accumulate in the lid, leading to uh, uh, ptosis. And additionally, born with the frac uh, fracture, frac uh, fracture in the orbital rim, the fracture fragment can uh, displace into the lid, leading to mechanical ptosis. Aponeurotic ptosis, aponeurosis is the tendon of the levator muscle which lift the uh, lid, can get detached. Usually it's attached to the skin and the tarsal pit, can get detached and go backward. And then of course you will see some salient feet. One is this high lid crease compared to the other side. Lid crease will be high and there will be ptosis and but if you check the levator function will be good and the patient might complain, condition gets slightly worsened toward the end of the day and there will be brow overaction. So clinical diagnosis or aponeurosis is quite possible, which can be corrected with surgery. And the myogenic, the muscle belly of the levator muscle can get damaged by penetrating injury like this, or sometimes even a small injury can lead, penetrating injury through a small wound can lead to levator muscle damage and the ptosis. Another thing is the fracture in the roof with fracture fragment uh, damage in the levator can also lead to uh, ptosis. The neurogenic uh, ptosis, we know the, the levator is supplied by the third nerve. If the third nerve get, uh, get damaged at orbit or skull base on brain stem can lead to uh, uh, neurogenic ptosis. So if it's in the orbit, the, uh, the eye movement may be normal or only the superior rectus is impaired. The rest of the eye uh, movements may be normal. Then of course you have to think about possible orbital uh, uh, injury in the orbit. And the skull base, of course, you will have the full uh, third nerve involvement uh, along with uh, sometimes other uh, uh, ocular motor nerve involvement as well. Uh, that is a sixth and fourth nerve involvement. Uh, plus, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, sensor impairment will help you to diagnose skull based fractures. And the brainstem uh, discussed earlier, you can get long track signs uh, uh, with full uh, third nerve palsy. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation, but before that, I must share uh, a few, two other sayings by, uh, by uh, uh, Sir Arthur Cornell Doyle in his book in Sherlock Holmes. There's nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. Never trust two general impressions, but concentrate yourself upon details. I think it's quite right, mm -hmm. relevant for a clinician who works in the uh, casual room. So improve your detective power, deductive power, so that you can show your colors at the casual room. Thank you very much. 
thank you dr shamir for that interesting and very methodical lecture uh, thank you very much so uh, we are moving on to the next uh, session uh, it's about safe living we have dr jagat ratugam gave with us is the consultant neurosurgeon at uh, national hospital of sri lanka colombo uh, over to you sir it's about safe living is it a dream thank you very much uh, good afternoon to everybody uh, this is a topic which normally uh, delivered by many other uh, physicians or community physicians but uh, uh, two of us myself and dr uh, swarna kumar who is a, uh, currently a president of the college of orthopedic surgeons and i am a vice president of the neurosurgical association of sri lanka thought that now this is enough for us to uh, treat uh, secondary injury and we have to uh, do a primary prevention because uh, it's endless uh, trauma coming in every day we are working uh, very hard uh, to deal them and uh, we see a lot of you know uh, the the impact on uh, society so therefore uh, we have we are about to launch our product uh, with the um, association of uh, surgeons with the uh, current president uh, college of surgeons uh, dr jayendra panando uh, safe living project so when i was invited for this lecture so i was delighted to tell about how we can as a team uh, to deliver safe living and it is not a dream so at the end of the my uh, presentation you might realize that there is a possibility of ending all this injury uh, so in my lecture i i just bring a uh, few uh, uh, things to uh, acknowledge the impact of injury so trauma is a leading cause and a preventable cause uh, of death not in only in sri lanka but in other countries as well because of uh, vehicular dependency and the work of uh, war conflicts and a risk behavior firearms assault non adhering to safety standard at work and home and uh, high risk sports have contributed to this uh, health uh, challenge so this will have a implication for healthcare uh, as a uh, professionals delivering the healthcare and also to the government as a healthcare cost and uh, and the end uh, the quality of life of these victims are been uh, uh, the main issue so south asian uh, region account for approximately one third of the global uh, total number of injury and therefore uh, if you calculate lives lost well in advance of normal life expectancy make the impact of trauma equal to cancer heart disease and hiv combined in usa so most of the injuries we treat in our trauma centers for adult and pediatric care are preventable fortunately there is a cure prevention the need for greater injury prevention effort is therefore very clear so as doctors nurses and other categories of healthcare system are working very hard and uh, to deliver life saving trauma care and that is as i have mentioned before is a secondary prevention it's our duty to unite and build a total injury free society which is the aim of our primary prevention so in uh, when you go to the history of injury prevention it dates back uh, 1940s with the biomechanical studies of d heaven and the later by gordon uh, present from uh, has been advised by in 1960 uh, the hayden is an ep epidemiologist and noted that the familiar triad of infectious disease uh, in epidemiology uh, causing agent host and environment was applicable for injuries as well so therefore the model was later elaborated as a matrix that distinguish between primary which call a uh, prevent secondary at the event and the tertiary post event uh prevention strategies 
So what is injury? The definition, uh, physical harm or damage to someone's body caused by an accident or an act attack, head, back, knee or other uh, the body parts and it is according to the Cambridge uh, Dictionary. Also known as a physical trauma damaged by the body caused by external force in a Wikipedia. So how, how can we uh, live safely by injury prevention? So it is a injury prevention is an effort to prevent or reduce the severity of bodily injuries caused by external mechanisms such as accident before they occur. So the reasoning is that the common meaning attached to the accident is a random or chance event and thus one that cannot be prevented. But however, extensive research has now yielded uh, evidence showing that the most injuries are predictable and therefore preventable according to the Journal of Epidemiology. So safe living by injury prevention. Uh, so how, how, do you, how do we do? Injury occurs as a consequence of relationship uh, of you between things and its prevention is achieved by managing this relationship. So injury prevention is not the something what that can implement on people by force but it has to develop within the people so injuries are hidden everywhere every time and every moment unless you manage them with your conscious mind so i will bring you back uh, of our uh, lord buddha's uh, arya ashtangika marge or noble eightfold pathway where the mindfulness and the uh, perfect uh, uh, concentration or a samma uh, sati and or samma samadhi will bring you uh, uh, self consciousness to prevent this injury. And further elaborating on a stupa, so the noble eight pathways are being divided into three: mor uh, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Uh, morality is a sila, concentration is a samadhi, and a wisdom is a uh, panya. Uh, so in concentration, samadhi, it comes uh, the samma sati and samma samadhi. So mindfulness and a perfect uh, concentration. So what is the goal? Safe living by practice of injury prevention. This is a Colombo city uh, seen at night. It's very illuminated, but every day, every uh, moment, unless the current uh, uh, the curfew uh, the trauma is happening people are uh, falling in as a victims of trauma so this is one of my uh, patients whom uh, i have operated middle of the night uh, with the one of the senior registrar from i i selected this photo because uh, samira was delivering the eye injury you can see a, a person who had fall uh, from uh, unprotected stairways under the influence of alcohol. The leaf has, uh, you know, branch of uh, uh, tree has gone right across the uh, medial wall of the eye and entering into the brain. So this patient actually after surgery, proper surgery at initial crucial time, saved eye as well as brain with uh, 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 debridement of the, uh, the tract. So we see a lot of uh, things when you walk along the roads, uh, unsafe uh, behavior of three wheeler. You can see uh, one child was moving as a fifth or a sixth passenger in the tri show and, and see the crowd at the, the, the environment of the road. And if there is any injury, so these people will all will be uh, victims. And, and also uh, I just highlighted because I don't want to bring the uh, hugely argued uh, topic, the elephant attack for the society. Why we, we have encroached their territory and now we are the victims of uh, uh, injury. So how to do this? So we have to study how others are doing. And this is the American Institute of Architects, New York uh, uh, introduced how the city designed to be safe and promoting safety and it is a part uh, part of a, a partnership with the colleges 
and also uh, uh, other other uh, professionals and bringing them all together and making a, a safe uh, uh, new york city so that is the our aim and uh, other people also uh, create a similar type of work in order to bring the region wise the safety uh, issues uh, safety measures and this is how they are done uh, that the great lakes and the mid atlantic violence and injury prevention is been uh, uh, taken up and and they are available for us to study how our setup should be tailored down uh, in order to prevent injuries and there are some uh, published data uh, about this preventing injuries uh, on a on a easily accessible way and uh, to introduce uh, this uh, injury prevention uh, the who has made a handbook for injury prevention for the medical graduates because when at the time of their medical curriculum this has been integrated as a as a uh, education curriculum where they are being advised about how medical professional have to have a critical role in treating trauma victims as well as promoting injury prevention activities and it it has also been uh, observed that the present medical nursing curriculum in the member states uh, is not adequately uh, been uh, you know uh, included and uh, so based of that they have made this uh, a handbook and it is available uh, and down can download through the internet on this website so this is one of the audit which i uh, have been involved but uh, my colleague has been presented he is a uh, dr aditan uh, audited uh, of one month uh, uh, admissions to the neurotrauma center uh, when uh, with the neurotrauma uh, the trauma to the head and out of 150 patients 83 was male patients and uh, 65 were working age and uh, road traffic accident account for 65% of the admission of 98 and uh, out of this 66% of uh, uh, or 65 cases were due to a motorbike and 27% uh, due to the three wheeler so so you can uh, identify uh, real uh, causes for the uh, or a culprit for a uh, most of the road traffic accident so therefore the research research is a, a must and we have to prove that the certain measures which we will bring in the future will impact on our trauma care so i will start by topic by topic uh, which i want to bring uh, in uh, our safe living project safety of the children so when we are uh, talking about the safety of children the baby walker safety is important because those are to be uh, one of the cause for injury and then uh, i will uh, safely uh, uh, the carbon monoxide poisoning as a different topic i will uh, talk later the fire safety also will be coming burns and scales my plastic colleagues might talk about uh, drowning and a safe schooling and safe tuition classes are very important in order to prevent our children is getting uh, victims of injury and uh, awareness of the friends and the associates also as a family uh, and uh, the parents we should have their our all uh, you know information in order to prevent uh, your children uh, are getting into a, a crisis situation we we need to talk uh, as a medical professionals falls in all age that is also one of the major cause as far as i am concerned as a neurosurgeon because they will be coming with the head injury and sometimes they are on uh, blood thinning drugs and the consequences are very uh, dramatic and uh, so not only the head injury they can have a hip fractures cuts even serious uh, uh, other injuries like you know the 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 liver lacerations and sometimes splenic injury so how do we do that so some of the insight 
clean up clusters, repair or remove uh, tripping hazards, install grab ha uh, bars and uh, handrails for people who have tendency, avoid wearing loose clothing, light uh, uh, is to be right and wear shoes to prevent the injuries to the foot, make uh, non-slip floors and uh, most of the, the old age uh, group should be living in the same floor without uh, you know using the stairway, stairways and uh, move carefully so walking aids has to be advised if it is required for their safety so car seat safety is i think uh, neglected in our country but I, we are trying our best in order to bring this uh, legislation so all children under the age of 8 years must ride in a car seat and uh, uh, or a booster seat so they should not be allowed to sit in the front uh, front uh, uh, seat and uh, and until they are been having a uh, reaching a, a, a specific height at least about 5 feet for for them to wear a safe uh, seat belt as I have previously mentioned, baby walker safety, some of the injuries, head injuries and the other injuries are occurring because of people are being uh, given uh, baby walker safety and sometimes sometimes these uh, the, uh, uh, the products are not up to the standard of safety. Stair gate safety is must. Every household which has a stairway should be protected of uh, their children having a stair gate, uh, safe, safe stair gate and the helmet. So in our society, still we are fighting to get uh, all the uh, uh, motorcycle, motorcyclist wearing helmet, but in other societies where the, uh, the developed world is wearing compulsory helmet for even for the, uh, the, uh, the, Foot cycles and also even tricy, uh, tric uh, tricycle wear uh, children uh, who use the tricycles they wear a helmet to, in order to prevent their head injury. In my uh, 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 presentation if I don't cover uh, child abuse uh, but it is not my part but I am uh, seeing as a clinician uh, there are things which uh, we have to do as a primary prevention. Uh, and the secondary prevention and tertiary prevention responding uh, and stopping abuse before it occurs as a clinicians and uh, and get some involvement of the society and making society uh, as a primary uh, what you call stakeholder of uh, preventing child abuse and secondary prevention focusing on which uh, we as a clinicians we are involving and tertiary prevention as a legislative uh, and also uh, as a part of uh, uh, child care organizations, they should be involving. And uh, the safe working environment, we are now as a clinician, I am now not safe in my work environment. Why? Because of the Corona. But before Corona, I was looking at many things which is that is my working environment is safe so lift uh, the corridors where you are working with the uh, items those all every day you have to be in, in conscious mind and and looking for injury prevention rather than uh, falling as a member of a victim a victim of a injury and and look at the other page other members uh, of uh, safety and regular check for fire protection and and have some drills when you are dealing uh, with the uh, you know explosive uh, or potentially explosive devices alcohol has made uh, us uh, to think uh, in in very seriously because it has uh, caused uh, many of our injuries are uh, alcohol victims uh, under the influence of alcohol getting victims for the injury and uh, it could be unintentional injuries could be unintentional or intentional injuries and both are uh, behind both of these injuries behind is uh, alcohol 
and other uh, uh, issues which i want to discuss is uh, distracted driving so research has shown distracted driving has caused uh, uh, caused many injuries and uh, so even the legislation is available you can see while you are driving many people are still on the phone texting answering and uh, it's not expensive to have a bluetooth or a, or a, a device which will uh, take uh, your distraction so this is what i wanted to uh, highlight uh, falls among elders already i have discussed and carbon monoxide poisoning which we don't uh, talk about but as an injury but it is an injury because some people might come to you uh, under the uh, you know uh, unconscious status and uh, because of the carbon monoxide if they are lucky to reach but some of them will be found dead so recently we there were a couple who were uh, living uh, living in a hotel uh, found to be dead next day morning so when uh, the the potential uh, source of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is seen at the cloth dryers heaters house fires kitchen and ga kitchen gas stoves and the ovens and fireplaces and gas uh, water heaters which many people will not use but some of them might be the uh, you know day to day use how to prevent so it is not expensive to have a, uh, a carbon monoxide uh, detectors it's not expensive and if you are uh, in a closed space using these items can be uh, used as a carbon uh, monoxide detector and prevent major uh, disaster and the other things which i am going to bring about is a poisoning so drugs and the household chemicals are been uh, day to day and night is been poisoned either to children or to have adults for intentional uh, self harm so if you are going to have them please keep and safe shield and uh, uh, so that there is no access for unintentional use and uh, so there are certain things which uh, uh, household chemicals can be uh, misinterpreted and have uh, cause some uh, poisoning so always read the label before using the product keep chemical product in their original bottles and not uh, and or a containers never mix household uh, products together and wear protective clothing when they are been used and turn uh, turn on the fan or open windows when you are using them and uh, keep ch children always away from these storage places and the safe home now i have talked about uh, uh, behavior but the some of the things which we come across is a, a construction failure recently you have seen uh, a five story building has collapsed and the whole family is uh, being uh, 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 victim and housing construction so when uh, the housing construction is uh, done electricity supply lighting uh, structural plan all should be uh, approved by the professionals not by the people who are being you know uh, given some bribes and uh, you know getting uh, them uh, passed and uh, always think about how, how, how home surrounding for whether unsafe pits or wells are available protect them control access to the road Uh, no children should be access to the road without uh, proper control uh, gates and correct use of appliances within house wearing safety gloves uh, especially when uh, uh, stoves or uh, ovens are being used and uh, and make uh, available uh, communication method in case of if there is an emergency and you have to everybody have any household has to have emergency contact list and training family members how to seek for help if uh, if there is any emergency and availability of a first aid box with the uh, un, un uh, what do you call expired uh, drugs and first aid training should be commenced as a globe uh, globally and uh, locally uh, each family member at least have some idea and and train at least one family member who can take care of the others and uh, safety storage i have already mentioned and the sharp instrument and always 
think before you leave home whether your children are le- who are who have been left at home is safe or your elderly father or mother uh, is there are they are uh, safe at home the home fires is also one of the major issue in our sri lankan setup as well because there are so many uh, uh, issues with regard to construction as well as uh, use of uh, electrical items and we have to have some plan every house all should have uh, how to escape if there is a fire and what to be done and uh, as a uh, advice when if there is a fire get out stay out and call for help rather than trying to uh, handle the fire so as my uh, presentation in the beginning i have mentioned about motorcycle safety but which we have not uh, covered uh, in detail uh, protective gears which we are not uh, adhering in sri lankan setup the proper helmets wearing jackets and uh, wearing uh, gloves and the shoes will prevent uh, uh, most of the soft tissue injury and i think my colleague dr yasas is agree with me uh, because uh, they are the people who look after this most of the uh, soft tissue injuries whereas spine and the brain injuries are being handled by us so motorcycles and the three wheelers are the major uh, culprit in our uh, injury uh, laden uh, society in sri lankan setup uh, the national policy and the strategic framework on injury prevention and management in sri lanka was published by non communicable disease unit and this is available for healthcare workers to work out and to make uh, use uh, but it is actually isolated and is getting now uh, developed and even we are been invited uh, as a part of uh, professionals who are dealing the injuries to make uh, this more further uh, uh, developed and and try to uh, get into uh, practice so this is a conversion of guide how to avoid the injuries and it is available and uh, another practice guide for child injury prevention is also available so at the, at the at last in summary so delivery of uh, safe living is not not a dream but it is a uh, it is a true potential uh, uh, goal which can uh, uh, be achieved by your action so mobilize in this uh, particular uh, uh, scenario we have to mobilize partners in injury prevention so healthcare professionals uh road safety uh, construction engineers uh, and also legislative uh, members and also uh, the government as a part of a, a team which will focus on uh, uh pre- injury prevention have a regular awareness program utilize media for not for other purpose but for the prevention of injury and uh, utilize video clips posters and also uh, uh, i would with my project if our project will come in we will be showing at least every week some of the major victims of uh, injury uh, how they are being managed and uh, what will be their outcome to give some shock to the society so that they will understand the implication they think that the people who are riding at the motorcycle riding at the speed of 100 kilometers per hour thinking they are not being uh, going to be a victim but they will be a victim on one day and uh, use your alcohol when you are not as a driver or, or use uh, uh, permitted uh, level because you don't think that uh, you can escape every day and uh, encourage uh, most of the ngo organizations to help us to make uh, road safety and also Uh, improve the vehicle safety and uh, in our project we are advising uh, government uh, in order to bring uh, new legislation for motor vehicle safety that means not only the emission test there has to be a check for their road worthiness and involve law in, as i have mentioned already and uh, involve legislation so that the drunk can uh, drive is a crime so that that should be stopped and uh, so 
as a professionals we are trying to support as community and design safe living safe working safe driving which will bring the safe roads and also uh, building safe homes and uh, protecting our children and our future and so therefore it's uh, uh, it's a teamwork so i would uh, again uh, thank my uh, the college of uh, uh, sri lankan association of medical association for giving me this opportunity to present this uh, uh, lecture and uh, hopefully we will be also as a part of a, a team uh, will be developing uh, our project uh, into a success thank you uh, thank you dr atukamage for that very thought provoking lecture and injury prevention is actually one of the priorities of sri lanka medical association so we hope that uh, all of you can work together with us and towards uh, the goal of save sri lanka dr sang yes uh, thank you and we are moving on to the next uh, presentation uh, it's about management of burns uh, we have dr yasas abe vikrama the consultant plastic and reconstructive surgeon at kalamba south teaching hospital uh, for this presentation or to you dr asas uh, thank you sanka uh, i'm grateful to the sri lanka medical association for this opportunity to uh, share some of the thoughts about burn management so i put my topic management of burns when a burn happens burns devastate lives it kills when it doesn't it can leave lifelong scars psychologically and physically and it is a major national health burden and the etiology may be accidental suicidal or homicidal and if we think about the modalities of burn injuries there are two types these are thermal injuries the heat related injuries and non thermal injuries non heat related uh, which are electrical and chemical injuries flame burns if you see the first two photos are a major culprit in adult burns in sri lanka if you compare the two photographs the person who stands tall is an accidental burn whereas the other girl is a suicidal kerosenoid burn also hot water scalds hot fluid burns and contact burns we also include radiation burns the sun uh, burns as well as the ionizing radiation into this category then when we consider non thermal burns chemical injuries commonly acids and alkali are common in our sector especially acid injuries uh, which is a hatred injury to use it to disfigure people and uh, then electrocution burns can be the domestic electrocution which is less than 1000 volts uh, voltage and injuries are common in children and industrial setup the commonest problem is not the local burn but arrhythmia which can be caused Uh, when the electric current passes through the conducting system in the heart high voltage electrocution more than 1000 volts can cause injury in two ways one is if you go 3 meters near a high tension line even without contact you can have a flash burn it can just arc towards you and have a sort of flame burn if you uh, see the top third picture if you contact a high tension line when current is passing it doesn't have to be a metal object you can have entry injury and a exit wound and along that pathway due to the heat generator you can have compartment syndrome and we have to actively look for compartment syndrome in these patients and if necess necessary might be doing a fasciotomy then i thought uh, to do a overview on burns in 20 minutes is impossible so i thought i'll discuss some of the common topics major thing is to discuss the myth of the bottle cap uh, kerosene oil bottle lamp top limb burns out of the 12 years i have been treating burns 
managing burns. I have seen only two bottle lamp injuries, uh, true bottle lamp injuries, where the house did not catch fire. And both these injuries were less than 1%. So the truth is, though we are not ready to accept, the media is not ready, ready to, to accept, is majority of these burns are suicidal kerosene oil burns and the rest are homicidal kerosene oil burns. The message is when these people come, they are already in trouble and we have to treat them with empathy, understand the problem and help them. Next thing, contact burns, especially when the child touches the motorcycle silence, when the father comes home, these are deep burns. These are not to be treated in the GP setup unless the burn is very small because they might need skin drafts or can cause bad scarring. Chemical burns is an entity where we have to be concerned about caregiver safety. If When we are treating burn patients, wear your gloves, uh, safety attire because some of the chemicals can cause in small amounts can cause life-threatening injuries. So acid burns, we uh, told that they are used to disfigure. Eye injuries are common. And then some of the specific uh, chemicals can cause organ damage. And uh, we'll be discussing irrigation, burn irrigation. We need prolonged irrigation for uh, acid and alkali burn patients. Uh, about electrocution, I think I covered that area then as uh, uh, Dr. Atukumke mentioned inhalation injury uh, when a patient is exposed burn patient is exposed to the uh, burn heat especially in an entrapped scenario and with facial burns uh, and smoke inhalation immediate injury to the respiratory mucosa comes in the above the larynx area and you can get swelling of the mucosa and get strangulated. So these patients we have to observe and be ready to intubate at the earliest sign of strido otherwise they can go into obstruction. Below larynx injury comes with irritant material and presents after about one week as a bronchonemia pneumonia like picture and you can't do anything at that time. So initially identify these patients, start chest physiotherapy, uh, early mobilization and initial nebulization with n cysteine and heparin solution. Any patient found unconscious in a burn scenario, again which was mentioned in the previous lecture as well, is carbon monoxide poisoning unless excluded which is a rule of the thumb. Uh, these patients can be with support of high flow oxygen and support with therapy. Some of them can be saved, but when a patient is unconscious in a burn scenario, in trap burn scenario, there are other burn injuries which can make the burn very severe. Then when a burn is full thickness and circumferential in arm, leg, trunk, chest, neck, it can cause a constriction and we call it an scar and can cause distal ischemia and swelling and it's necessary to do a release procedure called escarotomy to prevent further injuries. Burns in genitalia can't be dressed in the closed technique. We use open technique for burn dressings in genitalia with uh, poidonide in ointment every three to four hourly and also use catheter, early catheterization because once the swelling is there, especially in children, it's very difficult to uh, organize urine passage. Regarding hand burns, dressing has to be done individual fingers separately with crepe bandage so the patient can move, move when he's out of the removable splint. In between, the patient is put on a removable resting splint, which is in the immobilization position or elderly person in the uh, position of function. And get them to mobilize and get independence as soon as possible because stiffness is very common. You can't elaborate more on 
adequate pain relief, tetanus toxoid, and tubes in like bigger burns, more than 20% burns, uh, using NG tube. Patients who had to be uh, fluid resuscitated, that's more than 10% in children, more than 15% in adults, you have to have a catheter. Uh, and antibiotics in burns is not promoted because burn is heat sterilized. So we don't start antibiotics until day four or five when the secondary colonization causes fever. However, in some instances, after interventions, we tend to start antibiotics, but start with simple antibiotics. And major burns, electrocution burns, chemical burns, burns more than 20-25%, uh, extremes of age, pregnant people, always better to be sent to a specialized center, at least hospital-based care. It's not safe to ma manage larger burns in the general practice setup. So skin is the most common organ in all. It's a very, it's the largest organ system and it's a complex, has multiple functions and has specialized adaptations. Uh, and at the stratum basale, there's germinal epithelia which can replicate fast and cause up injury, closer injury by epithelialization. And these germinal element go down into the dermis uh, around the hair follicles, sebaceous glands and sweat glands. So in the upper dermis, the reticular dermis, there's a rich supply of germinal epithelia. In the uh, deeper dermis, the reticular dermis, that is not that common and un in the subcutaneous tissue there are no germinal epithelia left. So when a burn occurs in the epidermal side, that is the epidermal burn, if there is no infection or desiccation, the burn can heal very fast and will heal without scarring. This is even true when the burn is in the upper dermis uh, where all the rich vascular network, nerve endings are there. Uh, and a lot of germinal epithelia, they will heal within two weeks and we may not have to skin graft. Skin grafting is when a burn can't heal by itself with primary intention. Any burn will heal with secondary intention in about two or three months, but that is by granulation tissue, scarring and scar contracture, which can lead to deformities and disabilities. So when it goes to the deeper dermis, less epith germ uh, germinal epithelia and as well as less blood supply. So these may not heal within the two or three weeks, which may prevent primary wound healing. When it comes to full thickness burn, the whole dermis will become a coagulum, which is called an scar, and ca they can't heal. They have to be supported with skin grafting. So, and the body response to burn injury, there's a local injury, Local response as well as a systemic response. The local response, there's an area which is dead already by the heat. But surrounding that, there's a threatened area which is called the zonostasis where microscopic is stalled. That can die or live by the, depending on our management. If we manage well, that area will recover. Surrounding that, there's an area of hyperemia, inflammation. In a 25% burn, the whole body will be involved in the area of hyperemia. That is, the whole patient will be inflamed like a septicemia in a 25% burn, which is a fairly smaller burn. And if we manage the patient well, we can stop it from deepening and uh, widening in the area. Systemically, the circular syst circulatory system is affected and there's leakage at the microcapillary level and a patient can go into hypovolemic shock, maintaining the same fluid amount within the body. This third, third space losses, which goes on for 24 to 48 hours. After that, it, it is going to correct. So it, to sustain the sustain uh, circulatory volume, we have to resuscitate the fluid in more than 10% in children, 15% in adults burns. Temperature control, immune, immunity goes down, respiratory system can be affected, they can get into ARDS even in the absence of inhalation injury. Gut uh, can stall and 
translocation of uh, bacteria due to gut mucosal breakdown can cause sepsis. Metabolic rate can go up to three times the normal in burn patients. This is burn care, emergency burn care in a nutshell. First aid, there are only two parts. Stop the burn or get the patient out of the burning area. Cooling, which is the most important message I want to give. If I can give that message, everything else is not as important. I'm elaborating in the next slide. Then look for other injuries and you go for a trauma, primary survey, secondary survey and re-evaluation after at the end of assessment and primary survey, airway, whether there are uh, inhalation injuries and we start oxygen, breathing, whether there's a ventilatory system, it's affected, the circulation, large book annually, assessment of the sur burn surface area, starting Hartman's solution in large burns, even before calculation of the surface area, and uh, look for caprifil, blood pressure, and sending blood for assessment, and uh, disability, the neurological con uh, conscious level, and exposure, and env environmental control in E. And avoid hypothermia in the burn patient by keeping the patient on a covered trolley and keeping them covered. Uh, secondary survey, ample history and full body examination. So this is the most important slide. It has to be known in every household. When a burn occurs, get the patient out of the burning area and cooling is the most important in all burns with running room temperature water for 20 minutes, not in tubs, not in buckets, running room temperature water for 20 minutes, which is effective up to three hours after a burn. And it removes retained heat and flushes out chemicals. Uh, in chemical burns, if it is powdered chemicals, we brush it off before irrigation. And after that, keep the patient warm with uh, keeping the patient on a covered trolley, covered with a blanket. Then fluid resuscitation, more than 10% in children, adults, 15% in adults. Uh, we resuscitate with fluid because the uh, chance of hypoalemia is there and uh, we need the timing of the burn, total burn surface area and depth of burns to assess, give, assess the fluid resuscitation because we don't consider erythema for uh, fluid resuscitation. We use Parkland formula, Hartman's solution is the best, uh, normal saline is the next best, dextrose is not an option. Half of the 24 hours volume is given in the first 8 hours, next half in the next 16 hours. And maintenance fluid is given for children with half normal saline uh, in addition to the uh, uh, resuscitation fluid. We prefer crystallized for the first 24 to 48 hours and the resuscitation is guided and adjusted by the urine output minimally 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour. But in special circumstances, compartment syndrome, chemical burns, sometimes we may require 1 ml per kilogram per hour uh, urine output. So assessing the burn wound, we have to know the depth of the burn, area, and the time elapsed, and whether there are other inhalation injuries and other injuries. Coming to our diagram again. So in epidermal burns, we have a lot of germinal epithelia. So when that happens, there's redness, minimal blisters, cap reveal. When you blanch, it will become red again fast because the vascular network is preserved. Painful because they are sensation, they heal very well and don't, don't leave any scars if you manage well. We use paraffin oil or poidonide ointment uh, and sometimes buoyant collagen dressings and they don't get any scarring. These are other lucky group, the upper dermal, superficial dermal burns. There are also, there's a lot of germinal epithelia which can heal the burn within two weeks unless there's infection, desiccation or any other complications. And so these burns, once the skin is peeled off, is pale pink. Blisters are common because the rich vascular network. Caprifil is common and it's very painful because the nerve endings are exposed. Management is burn scrub down and dressing. Common, commonly, the cheapest is sulfadiacin, but has to be done daily. Commercial dressings can be done at about four or five day intervals, but you have to judge. Uh, in my hospital, in Columbus South Teaching Hospital, we provide all children with commercial dressings uh, uh, for their burn care, we can't afford it in adults. Uh, 
and uh, they are usually spontaneous healing they don't need to go for skin grafting because they are healing within two weeks and uh, we have, in children we have got very good results minimal scarring uh, with bow and collagen dressings and rarely we might have to do skin grafting uh, this is the scrub down that i mentioned we uh, take the patient on anesthesia scrub all the dead tissue off then all the dead tissues are removed and we do whatever the type of dressing uh, primary dressing cellulosabilisin or collagen then a lot of gauze then crepe bandage and this is what a dressed burn patient should look like a single layer of gauze does not work in burn patients deep dermal burns don't have the luxury of having germinal epithelia or a good vascular supply so they look red but these are due to tattooing of rbc's minimal blisters caprifil is minimal less sensation they are not painful patient doesn't care and still we do a scrub down and dressing but we think of gra skin grafting early because this will not usually heal within the stipulated two weeks when it comes to full thickness burns we know it's not going to heal so usually part by part you can't skin graft large areas we cover these these uh, burns are white or waxy or charred no blisters no pain no caprifil these are scars when it's when it's circumferential it can cause distal ischemia uh, and compartment syndrome and uh, in that case we need to do an escrotomy this is an example of an escrotomy uh, the skin immediately expands and the uh, tissue tension goes down these people will usually need skin grafting so if you ask how i manage my burns this is what I do. Main thing is teamwork. It's a team. Otherwise, you can't manage. Everybody has to know what they're doing. And ongoing care, the initial resuscitation, emergency management, and then dressings, analgesia, and environment uh, controls, infection control by all staff from top to bottom, and the patient. The nutritional management, because the target is in larger burns, to prevent loss of more than 10% uh, of the initial body weight uh, due to the uh, uh, very high risk of uh, catabolism. Then psychotherapy for uh, as the larger burn patients can have depression and also post-traumatic stress disorder. Physiotherapy and occupational therapy is used largely to get the activities of daily living corrected and get reintegrate these patients into the society as early as possible. Scar care is also included because minimal scarring and minimal deformities and maximal function is our target. The most important member in the team is a patient and we involve social workers, family and friends as much as possible. Take-home messages, many modalities of burns there are some targeted treatments, but things like first aid, irrigation, has, does not differ and is the best treatment to reduce mobility and mortality than any of the sophisticated dressings. And major burns always to be referred to hospital-based care and team management can't be emphasized more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Asas Abhayvikrama for that uh, very informative presentation and giving uh, a lot of information and a lot of tips uh, on the management and very crucial things that you should be doing. With that, we have come to the end of uh, this symposium and the presentations for this symposium and we'll be moving to the next symposium on cardiology. But before moving into that, let's take about 10 minutes break during this time period we will be answering the questions that will be coming in the chat. And uh, then maybe the questions that they are maybe coming from the audience also. So uh, I would like to request Dr. Jagat and Dr. Asas to come to the table. And uh, we'll use about 10, 10 minutes time period uh, for answering the questions that come from the audience. Thank you. What are the measures that we can take to prevent road traffic crashes and road accidents in Sri Lanka. What are the different, say, educational or legislative measures that we can take? Yes, uh, I, I want to elaborate. Every two hours, uh, 49 uh, minutes, 
uh, there is a death occurring in sri lanka so the magnitude is so huge that the uh, the it's only the death but the amount of injury uh, uh, starting from head to toe is enormous and uh, every uh, surgeon uh, who's working for the country knows the impact of injury so therefore uh, how to prevent the injury we have categorized uh, what the government should be as a legislative uh, organization to bring uh, law into society so that means uh, the road is to be safe uh, by uh, uh, user as a pedestrian or a uh, rider or, or a uh, driver so what should be done as a driver to make the safe road that means the speed limits lane uh, dis- uh, discipline and also adhering to drive a, a safe vehicle that means the vehicle should be safe having all the necessary safety gears wearing seat belts uh, occupant should be wearing the seat belts and also having uh, child safety as I, we have mentioned before uh, we are having a child safe, uh, uh, safety uh, uh, equipments then uh, as a, a partner organizations to bring uh, improvement of the road safety that means uh, you know the the uh, engineering faculties and also engineers can build safe road so that means that the, there should not be any unwanted uh, you know uh, uh, unsafe areas in the road and make road safety and uh, for drive and as well as and the improvement of the uh, the road network for pass- uh, passengers like you know for pedestrians because the most of the uh, road traffic accident either rider or a driver is involved or a, or a passengers or the pedestrian so i would say almost one in one a pedestrian is a, a, are the victims so pedestrians are not safe so how they how do they fall into uh, trap is by uh, uh, walking unprotected areas when the when the enough and more payments are available they are walking on the road and crossing road without uh, 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 having uh, going through the 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 crossing uh, proper crossing and uh, the drivers do not care about passengers sometimes they ignore all the uh, what you call the the pedestrians and drive fast so the safe limits of uh, speed has to be encouraged in this society in order to prevent a major injury then uh, uh, the crossings which we have what you call open crossing stopping all the vehicle transport for passengers to cross should be uh, you know taken into past so we have to build a safe crossing by either overhead bridges or, or uh, underground bridges so that the patients uh, the people who cross the road are safe and and uh, they should not be you know uh, um, exposed to a unwanted uh, this injury then uh, other aspect uh, you have uh, asked me is a legislation so legislation wise we are trying our best and the recent i think trial of lane departure uh, is been our project which we have uh, um, uh, uh, discussed with the uh, transport minister uh, dr uh, mr dilum uh, uh, and then he was trying to get this in and you have seen a drastic drop but there is a congestion but you have to accept some uh, you know unwanted side effects but you have to bring the the legislation because the three wheelers and the uh, the motorcycle riders are the most victim so at the end of the day uh, when you uh, take a, what you call the, the 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 injury percentage wise they are the most 66% of injuries head injury and when you take the other injuries like limb injury and the soft tissue injury they are the also also again the same uh, percentages so bringing them into uh, legislation the speed limit should be encouraged to for the three wheelers and the motorcyclist wearing proper safety gears and uh, i think in the future there should not be any sort of uh, uh, three wheeler which does not have what you call at least uh, seat belts because the, they will be like you know open air speeding 60 80 kilometers and when there is a toppling they will be all thrown away like uh, uh, flowers everywhere and and they come to us with the major injuries including head injury spinal injury which we are dealing months and months and years 
which we, those money which could be allocated for prevention of other injuries and treat other illness. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jagat. Uh, Dr. Asas, uh, any final concluding remarks that you want to make? Still, uh, the most important message, uh, uh, President Sir, uh, what I want to give the whole country is that burn first aid. Irrigation with running room temperature water for 20 minutes and not applying anything as like people uh, apply uh, toothpaste, uh, kukultel, komarka, all these things can contaminate the burn injury. It's best to bring the patient to the hospital or the healthcare setup without any applications other than irrigation. Thank you. Uh I would like to ask one final question from Dr. Jagat. Now, uh, recently we have seen an attempt to improve the lane discipline with the police coming in full force. Yes. But unfortunately, after a few days, it seemed to be abandoned. So what do you think? Now, could this be a good time to establish lane discipline where the number of vehicles is less now, but now it seems to be completely abandoned? What do you think? No, it's uh, actually uh, it's our failure of our society. As a, anything what we bring into our society will be last for only three weeks or four weeks and then it fade. Uh, so th this is what happened in Corona situation uh, recently. We all were very much geared to prevent uh, Corona spread. Everybody was geared and some of the, you know, uh, unwanted uh, uh, people have given some, you know, uh, uh, remarks uh, that Nobody should wear a mask, have uh, this one because the country is safe. Now you see what happened now. So even the, the, the lane discipline, uh, when I talk about, when it brought down, uh, brought to the, you know, uh, in force, there was a uh, dramatic decrease of uh, uh, hospital admissions. And in fact, uh, uh, after long time, we had some, you know, empty beds in our uh, uh, wards. Of course, now when the curfew wheels also there, the empty beds are there, but otherwise overflowing all injuries. And uh, so therefore, uh, the, the measures what we are uh, telling for the government and as well as trying to bring uh, all the society together to give all the measures what we can bring uh, to live safely. And, and it's not a dream as I have mentioned, it can be applicable. And uh, everybody, every citizen is uh, having a role in this particular endeavor. Yeah, thank you. And we hope the decision makers will take note. And as the professional bodies, I think we have a response to work together towards safer Sri Lanka. With that, uh, we bring uh, close to this symposium, uh, this symposium to a close. And I thank all the resource person, Dr. Chamira Bandara, Dr. Yasas Abe Vikrama, and uh, all of you uh, for this uh, very Excellent presentation, Dr. Jagat Ratugamegi with your thought-provoking ideas and suggestions. And I will move into the next symposium, the final symposium. Again, a very important symposium on cardiology that is now in your heartbeat. And I would like to invite the team from the College of Cardiology, Sri Lanka College of Cardiologists, and its president, Dr. Stanley Amarasekara, consultant cardiologist to the head table and other resource persons as well. So we'll be moving to the next symposium. What do you? Thank you.